Now, if the body core temperature starts to fall, there is a risk that the body could become hypothermic. That means we need to conserve heat. So what we need to think about now is mechanisms for gaining heat and mechanisms for conserving heat we've already got, so they're not lost to a cold environment, so that there is not a contribution to the development of uh, hypothermia. And again, the first obvious one is behavioural change. When we're cold, we tend to curl up a bit, and this reduces the surface area of the body. Obviously, if we can, we're going to put warm clothes on. and We're going to behave in a different way to try, to try and warm out ourselves up. When the body temperature drops, of course, this is detected where? Well, again, it's detected in the hypothalamus, which samples the temperature of the blood passing through it. And the hypothalamus, when the body temperature starts to drop, will cause increased muscle tone. The muscles will be more toned up. And you're probably aware on a cold day, if you're used to cold environments, you do feel a bit tensed up. This is because the muscle tone will use up energy and that will generate heat. So the first thing that happens is you get increased muscle tone to generate heat as a result of increased skeletal muscle metabolic activity. But then of course as we get colder this muscle activity becomes more profound and the muscles start switching on and off and we shiver. You get shivering. So shivering is a very effective mechanism for generating heat. Of course it uses up energy, but it generates a lot of heat because it's rapid involuntary skeletal muscle activity. And as we know, the end result of all energy chains is heat. So heat is going to be generated to warm the body up. The next thing that's going to happen is there's or indeed can happen before that, but another mechanism for keeping the body warm when it is in a cold environment is arterial vasoconstriction. The precapillary sphincters that we've already looked at will constrict, will get smaller. That will reduce their lumen, that will reduce the volume of warm blood which is going to the surface of the body, therefore less heat from that warm blood will be lost into a cold environment and as we saw in my cold arm it goes a whitish colour as a consequence. Contraction of hair erector muscles. Now in the skin as we know we have um, hair follicles and in those hair follicles we have a hair root and a hair growing out of the hair follicle. But also, we have muscles attached to these hair follicles called hair erector muscles. And when we're cold, these hair erector muscles will contract. Now if that contracts, it's going to pull the base of the hair that way. So that means the top of the hair is going to stand up and become more erect. So on the surface of the body, instead of the hairs being flat, as they would be when we're hot, the hairs can stand upright like this. Now the key thing about this is it's going to trap warm air near the surface of the body. Now why is the air near the surface of the body warm? Well, it's been warmed by the body. And if that air is able just to blow away, it'll be replaced by colder air. But if that air is trapped there, it's going to keep the surface of the body warmer because air is a very good insulator of heat. It increases what we call the boundary layer. Clothes do the same thing. They trap heat next to the surface of the body. Warm air. Now this isn't a particularly effective mechanism in humans, but it does work to a degree. And when we're cold, that's why we get, in English we call it goose pimples, you know the skin becomes all undulated. And the reason for that is that if the hair erector muscle contracts here, 
as well as pulling this hair up it's going to pull this area of tissue here down because it's contracting and it's got to pull on something and that means that bit will be dimpled down so the skin is all sort of up and downy like this and we call that goose pimples as a result of contraction of the hair erector muscles. So here we see the hair follicle in the dermis, again the subcutaneous tissue. This would be a sebaceous gland uh, associated with the hair follicle, but here we see the hair erector muscle. So the hair erector muscle pulls the hair in that direction, it's going to cause the hair to move that way, causing the hairs to become more erect, trapping more air in the boundary layer next to the surface of the skin. But as the hair erector muscle pulls on this area, it's going to cause this area of the skin to go down, causing a dimple, which in this country we call goose pimples. So when we're too cold, hair erector muscles will contract. Now any process in the body which gains heat is called thermogenesis. So the increased muscle tone was a muscular thermogenesis. The shivering was an also a shivering muscular thermogenesis. But there's another form of thermogenesis which is called metabolic thermogenesis. Now if someone's in a cold environment for a long period of time, their metabolic rate will start to increase. For example, one of the things that happens is they'll have an increased amount of thyroxine in the blood. And remember, it's thyroxine which controls and stimulates metabo metabolic activity in the cells. So you'll also get a non-shivering thermogenesis in cold adapted people because there is a metabolic component. All the cells of the body can be metabolizing more rapidly and generating heat. Of course, it uses up energy. This is why people who live in cold environments need a higher calorific intake because their metabolic rate, both in terms of shivering thermogenesis and non-shivering metabolic thermogenesis, will increase. And in fact, people subject to very cold environments, for example, people walking across Arctic wastelands, need to eat incredible amounts of calories to maintain thermogenesis to stop them becoming hypothermic. Now a particularly interesting area of physiology here is brown adipose tissue. Brown fat. And if you look in humans you do find brown fat. And this is especially active in young people and in children. So when babies are born they're very small and they are prone to hypothermia. That's why, as we've said, newborn babies should be wrapped up, placed next to the mother's body for warmth and hopefully allowed to suckle uh, almost straight away, next to the warm mother's body. Not only does that keep the child warm, it's very good to start off the bonding process between the mother and the child. But if children are exposed to cold stress, then this brown adipose tissue seems to be a tissue which is specifically designed to generate heat. It will use a lot of energy, but the mitochondria in the brown cells will work very actively and produce an awful lot of heat very quickly. It's like an emergency mechanism, brown adipose tissue. And this works in cold environments. Now, brown adipose tissue starts metabolising as a result of stimulation by the sympathetic nervous system. And in young children, babies especially, and probably young children, who are in cold environments, they can double their metabolic rate as a result of the activity of brown adipose tissue. So in young children, brown adipose tissue can account for a 100% increase in metabolic activity and therefore non-shivering metabolic thermogenesis. Now the problem is the older you get, the less active this brown adipose tissue becomes. This is probably one reason why we get middle-aged spread when you get into your late 30s and early 40s, you start becoming fat unfortunately. 
on how much you eat and how much you don't exercise. But the reduction, but young people can, can often eat huge amounts and not get fat, probably because the brown adipose tissue is burning off excess calories as well as generating heat. Very interesting possibility. But in adults, the contribution to non-shivering thermogenesis as a result of brown adipose tissue in cold environments is probably only an increase of 10 to 15 percent uh, in metabolic activity. Whereas in children it can be an increase of a hundred percent. Frostbite. Frostbite means death of tissue as a result of uh, as a result of cold. So as the tissue becomes colder and colder, the circulation to that tissue will reduce more and more until ultimately in humans you get a situation where there is no circulation to that tissue at all. That means the tissue will adopt the temperature of the environment. And if the environment is freezing, then that tissue will freeze. And that means that the individual cells which compose that tissue will freeze. Water in the cytoplasm, in the cytosol, of the individual cells will freeze. And as it freezes, it forms ice crystals. Those ice crystals will expand and rupture the cell membrane, break the cell membrane. And when the cell membranes are ruptured, that tissue is dead. It's quite interesting actually, in the United States particularly, you get a, a movement, I think it's called the cryogenic movement or something like that. But what happens here is, it's quite bizarre really, when people die they actually freeze them in liquid nitrogen. And the idea is that one day in the far distant future, when we've worked out how to heal the disease that these people have died of, what we can do is warm them up, bring them, bring them back to life and heal the disease that they originally died of. Absolute nonsense. Absolutely ridiculous. Because human bodies are a complex tissue. And each individual cell will have frozen and the membrane will be split open. You know, each cell in the tissues of their bodies will be completely destroyed. Absolutely ludicrous. Have nothing to do with it at all. It's nonsense. It's just people trying to make money out of people's fear of death. Let's just look at a, a, an example of frostbite. There's a photograph of a gentleman who went out walking in the snow, unfortunately. The reason he did it was because he had a psychiatric illness. But you can see it's damaged the sole of his uh, right foot quite significantly with the areas of dead tissue and seriously inflamed tissue. The other foot was even worse. So here we see an area of uh, ulceration where the tissue has actually died due to the, uh, a deeper frostbite injury as opposed to the superficial frostbite injury which is more uh, extensive. Dead tissue due to the cold, the freezing of the tissue. Now during the cold there is a peripheral venoconstriction. That means the superficial veins get much smaller. They constrict, therefore there is less blood going through the superficial veins, therefore loss, less heat is lost to the environment through those superficial veins. But how does the blood get back to the body if the superficial veins are constricted? How does the blood get back to the core of the body? Well, do you remember that we have superficial veins and deep veins? So when we're cold, the deep veins will remain open, but the superficial veins will constrict, so less heat is lost to the surface of the body. But as well as this, this brings about another mechanism. It's a bit complicated, but I think you should be able to follow it. It's called a counter-current heat exchange mechanism. So let's think about a uh, leg and a foot. So here we've got a roughly a foot. 
Now, the artery, of course, is going down deep inside the leg, carrying blood into the limb. And the vein, as we've said, runs fairly close to the artery. So blood will be coming down the artery and travelling back up in the vein. The artery, of course, will diffuse into smaller, will branch into smaller arteries and into capillaries to supply the circulation of the, the whole foot. So the blood will circulate round the foot and back again. Now, because the arterial blood is coming from the core of the body, the blood in the artery is going to be fairly warm. It's going, in fact, here it's going to be at near core temperature. But because the blood in the vein has already circulated round the foot, and heat has been lost from the blood that's circulating round the foot, the blood in the vein is going to be relatively cool. And remember, heat travels from hot objects, from hot bodies, to cold bodies. So what happens here is that heat is going to transfer from the warm artery into the colder vein in that direction. So because the two flow close to each other in opposite directions, heat will be transferred from the artery to the vein. What this means is that blood entering the periphery, in this case the foot, is already going to be relatively cooled. So the foot will be perfused with relatively cool blood, and that means that less heat will be lost from the foot to the environment because the blood flowing through it is already, already relatively cool. It also means that as the blood that comes from the foot flows back into the vein, going back towards the periphery, it will be warmed by the arterial blood. So when the blood returns to the core of the body, in the venous system, it will be already warmed, it will be warmer. It won't be as hot as the blood in the artery, but it will be warmer and it will prevent reduction in temperature of the body core. So this countercurrent mechanism, countercurrent meaning that the arterial blood is flowing that way, the venous blood is flowing that way, means that essentially the heat takes a shortcut, it's like a short circuit, between, directly between the artery and the vein, preventing excess heat being lost in the periphery. Now really that concludes our talk on the, uh, the principles, the physiology of thermoregulation. But I think it is worth mentioning uh, alcohol. Because people often drink alcohol in very cold environments. And this is actually a relatively, thing, a relatively dangerous thing to do. Firstly, alcohol is a peripheral vasodilator. It will dilate the peripheral arterioles. This will allow a lot of warm blood to go to the surface of the body and therefore be lost. So although the person feels warm when they drink, when they drink alcohol, it's because of the peripheral vasodilation stimulating the peripheral temperature receptors, making them feel warm. Because remember how warm someone feels is largely determined by their peripheral thermoreceptors in the surface of the body. And the other thing about alcohol is alcohol will cause a hypoglycemia. Alcohol lowers blood sugar levels. And when people's body temperature starts to drop, of course, they start shivering to generate heat. And if someone is hypoglycemic, shivering will be inhibited. So the shivering mechanism will not be working properly. So two very good reasons not to drink alcohol in cold environments. Now the next part of this talk we're going to think about now is what happens when the body temperature drops, what happens when someone becomes hypothermic.